Welcome back, my fellow Seekers. For those of you who subscribed after I made my video on the Hiawatha Crater, I wanted to add another scenario about the Great Flood. Genesis 7.11 states, In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day all the springs or fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and rain fell on the earth for forty days and forty nights. We need to look at this with a natural and supernatural worldview in order to solve this enigma. Now knowing Genesis came out of Egypt and the Jews were Egyptian citizens for hundreds of years before they were enslaved, I think the story is Egyptian in origin and the event happened in the Garden of Eden, which I hypothesize in my documentary review video as being Egypt's Nile Delta. I think the Great Flood event coincided with the banishment out of the Garden of Eden. Most likely, some of the Genesis stories are a fragment of a catastrophe and a political and religious instability. Genesis states that Noah lived for hundreds of years. I think this has something to do with the intervention of fallen angels with the cohabitation of human bodies creating a super race we might call the Aryans, or the Nephilim race, that God had to wipe out before their pride got out of hand. Noah may have been a hybrid to this cohabitation, giving him the ability to live long and not just miscalculation of what counts as a year. He may have been a pre-dynastic Egyptian royal or a governor of some sort. If there ever was a civilization that could build an ark, it would be the Egyptians. And it would have looked more like this. The ark may have been built on one of the branches off the Nile River in the Delta, or the Garden of Eden. Genesis hints poetically the springs of the great deep burst forth. I think this is a reference to tsunamis in the Mediterranean, possibly caused by the Hiawatha asteroid recently discovered in Greenland, or some of its fragments hitting the ocean and the seas. I don't think it has anything to do with the hydroplate theory. The fountains of the deep may have been a poetic way of saying tsunamis, also there may have been some earthquakes which triggered some large liquefaction happening within the delta, partially sinking some temples. Genesis also hints that it rained for weeks. Now, 40 days seems more symbolic, but it may have rained for 30 days, or 44 days. The point is, it rained a lot, and there's only one thing that could have caused so much rain, and that is a stalled out cyclone. At the initial impact over Greenland, the asteroid and its large fragments would have dispersed the ocean conveyor belt and the jet stream patterns in the North Atlantic, increasing temperature of the water and the air for a few weeks. Could this have been the cause of abnormal cyclones? Now, some might believe that during the Younger Dryas, the hurricane formations in the Atlantic would have been less frequent and intense. But according to USGS researcher Michael Tommy, he argues that more Category 5 hurricanes may have slammed Florida more repeatedly during the early Younger Dryas. So it's possible that some of the hurricanes diverted north to become a cyclone, like Cyclone Carmen, back in November 2010. Now I still think there's going to be a need for a supernatural intervention to really set up the conditions to make this a biblical event, and not just an ideology. The probability of a cyclone getting all the way over to the Middle East is very unlikely, unless the conditions were preset discreetly by God. And I think the force of nature that God would have used would have been a hypercane over strategic locations around the world. It was MIT professor Karia Manuel who proposed the hypercane in 1995. He created a computer model of what would have happened if an asteroid hit the oceans or the glaciers. He argues it would have flash heated the oceans over 400 degrees, creating a large amount of steam within a day. And with the large fragments, it would have stirred up the atmosphere and the ocean. It would have taken days at the impact zone for the ocean to cool back down to 100 degrees. In just a few days, it would have formed a small but very dense cyclone of winds over 300 miles an hour. After the initial impact over a few weeks, the asteroid and its many large fragments would have created a runaway greenhouse effect, possibly for centuries warming up parts of the ocean evenly. The hypercane would have started to expand into a full-size cyclone with winds over 200 miles an hour and with high water vapor content continuing to build up. After a week or two, the semi-hypercane would have started to move over to France or in the Strait of Gibraltar, weakening but then regaining strength as it reached the Mediterranean, where it headed east. If the conditions were set right, the hypercane would have possibly hit right over the Nile Delta, sucking up the moisture from the Delta and creating a feedback loop stalling for weeks 
if it was trapped by the dry high pressure over the Middle East. With the storm surge and the rain, the water in the delta would have partially become trapped. If it rained for 44 days non-stop with over 100 mph per hour winds, the water in the delta would have reached up to 150 feet, reversing the Nile's flow and flooding all the way down the Nile past Giza, but also trapping a lot of debris at the entrance of the garden. With the deserts to the east and the west, hundreds of thousands of people would have been trapped in the river valley and the delta, drowning all livestock and people who did not get on the ark for safety. It's possible that some of these demigods who took on Avatar bodies took God's warning as a bluff. Their pride blinded them of the reality of who is really in control of nature. Once the storm had settled, the Ark could have been pushed out to sea all the way to Turkey's coast. Once the water started to recede, the Ark may have had retractable sails and paddles to head back to Egypt to start anew, and most of the mutant humans would have went extinct. Now, to know if something like this happened, USGS researcher Michael Tumi argues you have to look for the undersea landslide deposits called turbotites, captured in the alluvial plain. Problem is, the farther back in time you go, the more these turbotites would erode and disperse from the alluvial plain, making it hard to know if those were natural deposits or caused by a catastrophe. We need to look for high concentrations in a layer under the silt of the Nile Delta and look for the bones of the people and animals who drowned along with any megalithic ruins buried under that silt, for which there could be evidence of. However, sandstorms over thousands of years would also erode any trace of water erosion. With the erosion we do see, it will be hard to tell if it was normal erosion process of the Nile. Also, if people re-sculpted the landscape and recycled ruins, this makes it very hard to determine if a specific event was caused by a catastrophe, especially if the event was short-lived. If a hypercane happened, we would also look for signs of a salt layer, but even that would get diluted over 12,000 years. But one thing that might give us a clue of something catastrophic happening is to look for the Clovis layer, according to archaeologist Ken Tanksley. Evidence in Ohio and other places hint to a rain of large meteor airbursts killing off some of the megafauna. There is a possibility that this has a connection with the sharp warm-up before the Younger Dryas. Looking for something like a Clovis layer in the Middle East could increase the odds of something catastrophic happening. Once everything subsided, the real extinction was about to happen with the remaining megafauna on Earth. For the next thousand years, the Earth quickly slipped back into an ice age until eccentricity sharply took over and then the second phase of the Great Flood took over and gradually flooded the coastlines of the whole world, including the Nile Delta for which one third is now underwater. This second gradual phase may have a connection with the Black Sea flooding hypothesis. I think the reality is this Great Flood may be more complicated and we might have to call it the Great Floods, for there may be different phases of this original asteroid event, such as the creation of glacial dam ruptures in the Pacific Northwest and other regions of the world. One last thing. I also want to point out, I think even the Atlantis legend was partially inspired by the Great Flood of Egypt but the original story came from Solnchis of Sias in the Delta, who passed the story to Solon and then to Plato six generations later. It's possible Egypt simply forgot some of their history. Now I have no doubt that part of the story is just simply a reference that Egypt may have known about a lost continent in the Atlantic with kingdoms. For it says, an island larger than Libya and Asia Minor put together, located in the Atlantic just beyond the Pillars of Hercules. Clearly the word island is not a good translation, continent would be better, but the ancients didn't have a good sense of scale judging by their maps. Plato says it was made up of islands but also a peninsula and was part of a very large landmass with ten kingdoms. Florida and the Caribbean is most likely the place that fits this description, for this is why Columbus named the first islands the Antilles, a reference to Atlantis. Also, the kingdoms most likely are the kingdoms of the Americas, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Incas, the Mississippians, the Olmecs, etc. I think our founding fathers were aware of this logical look on the legend. The Egyptians may have known about this lost land that Columbus and others were searching for. It's possible Egyptian explorers or even those who were dispersed from the garden sailed to find new lands and a handful may have arrived in the Americas, influencing their culture but also assimilating in a new identity. This is something Graham Hancock has argued. 
At the same time, the other part was the story of a lost city-state, which was most likely taken from another story which Solon and Plato combined together to make a more fitting allegory. Or maybe they simply just confused it over two different stories. By the time Plato received the story, it was only logical to correlate the two of what was possibly two separate stories into one due to misunderstanding or translation. I think partially one could argue Atlantis is Egypt when it comes to the lost city-state aspect of the legend. For Plato documents it was 23 kilometers or about 14 miles in diameter. This fits with the city of Cairo, meaning the place of the combat of the gods. This is also the entrance of the Garden Delta for which Plato says the city had mountains around and was in an oblong plain. Now, these aren't mountains, but they are plateaus, and it's possible over time that this could be some a detail that changes. So we can't take these stories too literal, but piece together to what makes the most logical sense with geography. Also, Egypt's hieroglyph for a city is actually a circle. Plato documents it was a city with circles made from three canals. Egypt is very well known for creating linear canals off the Nile. The early Egyptians could have easily diverted the Nile into circular canals around the main city-state. And cultures like the Sumerians created city-states, so it's not out of question that Egypt may have created city-states. If you look at the Nile upside down, it is in the form of a triangle, and at the top would be the capital city where the rulers and their families reside, on the top of the triangle or the pyramid. The reason why we don't see the lost city is because many of the ruins were recycled for the building of modern Cairo. Since the time of Alexander and even the dynastic Egyptians, man may be more destructive than a flood. Plato also references at the center of the city was a place where the rulers resided, with a garden protected by a canal of water and walls. The rings of the lands were based off a hierarchy, like a pyramid. Plato says Atlantis had a powerful navy. If the Egyptians knew about the Americas, it may be possible that some actually explored the Americas, just a handful. Plato references that the city would have had a large population, possibly hundreds of thousands of people, in the outer ring, and that the city was also near the sea, for which Egypt sits near the Mediterranean. It makes sense that the city would be at the entrance of the Garden Delta, and not within it, for that is the agricultural plain that feeds the city. So it's possible in a single day and night when the hypercane struck the city, it was submerged, as Plato says, under water and under the muddy sea, from which megalithic ruins have been unearthed. And I think it's very likely that some of the evidence of this lost city-state is under Cairo, the place of the combat between the gods and the one true god, the place of the deluge. I think there are a lot more megalithic evidence under the Nile, with most having been recycled and broken down as Brian Forrester has argued. This hypothesis seems far more logical than what YouTubers like Bright Insight has been popularizing on the Rickcat structure which clearly is a natural feature that almost every geologist will tell you. It just doesn't make any geographic sense to place a city-state in the middle of a desert. It's been a desert for tens of thousands of years, even in the Ice Age. Even during the Ice Age, it was more of a desert, actually. Yes, there were some lakes, but there was not enough sill to create any vegetation, unlike the Nile. There are some basic similarities, but that's not enough. That's just basic face value, like, oh, they look circular, so it matches Plato's description a little bit. But that's just not enough. Details matter. You can't build a city in this location. It just makes no geographic sense. As someone studying landscape architecture, I would say you need to let the landscape and the architecture give you the clues. And so far, most of the megalithic architecture is in Egypt, so maybe we need to focus on where the architectural evidence is. Whether you're religious or not, this is the most logical conclusion on the legend of Atlantis and Eden. I think those who are Freemasons and those in the Vatican might actually agree on this hypothesis. So if you agree, share this video with your friends and your families and your colleagues who study prehistory. I'm not willing to say that there is some lost planetary civilization or aliens, but I am willing to say that Egypt may be far older than we think, and something strange may have happened there. And from there, 
civilization was dispersed to the Greeks and to the Persians. This has been Enigma Seeker. Keep seeking those enigmas.